On the 25th of May, the world awakened to the horrifying news of the brutal killing of George Floyd in the American city of Minneapolis by a police officer who sat on his neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. The killing, which is a continuation of police brutality in the United States against African Americans, was condemned worldwide. It sparked global protests against the treatment of African Americans, not only by the police, but also by other communities. The history of the black struggle is not unknown to the majority of the people. According to historical records, the first Africans arrived in the New World in 1619, as demand increased for labor in the European settlements in America. Through the coming decades, millions of Africans were brought over to the Americas as slaves working on plantations and farms across the young country. Despite the continued struggle and freedom movements that took place in America following the creation of the United States, the deep-seated racist attitudes that many Americans had towards African Americans resulted in this racism being institutionalized over the decades. While slavery was officially prohibited in the United States under the 13th Amendment in 1865, the legislation included a statement that resulted in the continuation of the practice in a covert way. Section 1 of the amendment, despite initially outlawing slavery, adds a small exception. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States. This gave rise to an embedded discrimination within the US justice system that worked hand in hand with pre-existing attitudes. That same year, the Ku Klux Klan, a supremacist white American group, was born to terrorize and threaten the recently freed African Americans. They lynched, burned, and killed countless number of African Americans in private as well as in public, and many of these displays of violence gained large audiences. The initial birth of the KKK and its various resurgences, the largest being in 1915, resulted in many hate crimes being carried out against African Americans, especially in the South, forcing many to move up to the northern states. The KKK's popularity amongst many white Americans resulted in its members even being elected into office, where they were able to institutionalize racism even deeper into the American political system. Furthermore, some politicians had sympathies for these groups, which allowed them to further entrench discrimination in the US justice system. The continuation of this culminated in the passing of Jim Crow laws in several states, which forced segregation between black and white Americans. Until the civil rights movement in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, blacks and whites ate at different restaurants, drank from different water fountains, and went to completely segregated schools. I attended the last segregated school in the state of South Carolina, and that was 1976. I was uh, in the first grade when they shut that school down, and uh, we got bused to different uh, uh, different schools and on the first day one of the teachers said to us that we were going to be a bunch of losers and you know I was six years old and I, I had never encountered that type of negativity In 1965, the Jim Crow laws were eventually repealed by the U.S. government after public pressure from the civil rights movement, spearheaded by the likes of Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and Malcolm X. Despite the passing of the Civil Rights Act, racism, discrimination, and marginalization continue to take place across the United States against African Americans in both discreet and public ways. I come up during, during the, uh, the, uh, the 60s, you know, civil rights movement, all of that, you know what I mean, the uh, uh, black power movement, you know, um, you, know, and, you know, and so there was, uh, there was a lot of struggles that, that we faced, tremendous inequality, uh, brutality, um, these, those things was like commonplace, 
you know, um, and, um, you know, it's something um, to live through uh, those, those kind of uh, periods. When I moved to Savannah, Georgia at 13 years old, that's when I really, I, I can remember being called, you know, the N-word. That's when I can remember, you know, seeing this stark difference between uh, how whites live and how blacks live or how whites live and how everybody else lives. So that's when I could actually see the racial hierarchy and uh, that's when you, I could see how my grandfathers who were already men who were elderly and how they were treated by the other men who were their ages and even young uh, white men. I could, I could remember very distinctly seeing my maternal grandfather slightly bend his head, like slightly bend his back when he was in their uh, company. So when I moved to uh, Georgia, that's when I understood as I got older that, yeah, this, you know, racism in America is more than just a prejudiced thing. It's just not tribal beef. This is systemic. There's a, there's a hierarchy, a racial hierarchy with the whites residing at the top. When you grow up in a society where you are a minority, there are certain things that you have to learn. There are certain things that uh, are given to you that aren't given to other people. You know, how is it that I'm supposed to behave in front of the dominant society? How do we address police officers? How do we address uh, white individuals? How do we uh, present ourselves to others to make sure that we're non-threatening? Especially as black men, you know, we, we are taught that. Whether it's overtly or covertly, we are taught that you're supposed to deal with things a certain type of a way to make ourselves um, to see as, to seem as docile as we could possibly be, so that we don't present a threat and people feel threatened by us. My mother and my uh, and my father, they were both in the military, and they decided to get me out of the state of South Carolina. And so they got me, in, they put me in a Department of Defense school in Germany. And I was playing with some German kids. So I'm like about 10 years old and it's light outside. So we're having a good time, but then it starts to get dark. And the German kids circled around me and they started pointing at my backside. And all of a sudden things got real awkward. I took off running because I didn't, this seemed like this situation was about to go left, so I just took off running. And I got home, and uh, my dad said, well, what, why are you breathing so hard? I said, well, the kids was pointing at my backside. He said, oh, I forgot to tell you, you're supposed to turn into a monkey after dark. And I was like, and so he explained to me where they got that from. So like during World War I, uh, white American GIs or soldiers would tell uh, Europeans that the black soldiers would grow tails after dark. A little known fact is that amongst those early Africans who were brought over to the Americas, many were Muslims who had previously lived in Africa. Early records show that as early as 1682, Muslims existed in the Americas and were documented in the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which referred to these early Muslims as Mohammedans. Other evidence of these early Muslims also exist in the individuals' names. My family cemetery back home in South Carolina, I have family members with names like Layla, my great-grandmother. I have uh, family members from the 1800s named Rashid. And this is way before name change and became Vogue. This was their name and they never let go of their names. Nonetheless, the majority of early Muslims were forcibly converted, willingly converted in hopes of securing a higher social standing or forgot their religion over the generations. Due to this, awareness about Islam was dormant for centuries amongst the African-American communities. By the early 1900s, Islam was reintroduced to these communities in many forms, including the Ahmadiyya movement, the 5% nation, and the Nation of Islam. 
A big portion of African Americans found refuge in Islam because Islam offered them empowerment, equality, and true justice, something that was missing from the existing structures in America. Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? As a result, the majority of these movements were distinctively focused on black power and black empowerment. Thus, it came as no surprise that Al-Hajj Malik Al-Shabazz, also known as Malcolm X, became the face of Muslim Black America. The evolution of Malcolm X from a convict to a crucial member of the Nation of Islam and then his conversion to mainstream Islam provided an example and inspiration for many young African Americans who wanted to strive for equality and empowerment. I gravitated towards uh, the Nation of Islam. So then I began to study um, the teachings of the Nation of Islam and I came into the teachings of the Nation of Islam through uh, through the late minister, Dr. Khaled Muhammad. And then there were certain things about the nation's teachings that I could never, I could never grasp. And I used to talk to Dr. Khaled about it and uh, several other brothers. And I just made a decision the some July 20th, 1989, I will never forget it. I had went home for the summer I was 19 years old, my, one of my high school buddies, he came by, I was home on break, and he said, hey man, would, you want to go for a ride? And I said, sure. I said, where we going? He said, uh, I just want to take you somewhere, man, here's something different. He didn't know that I was already dealing with the Nation of Islam. I never shared that with him. So we get to this place called the Mary Bethune, um, Mary, yeah, Mary Bethune uh, Center in Valdosta. We go in. He said, hey, just have a seat on the floor like everybody else. Just sit over there. That's where the guys sit at. I said, sure. So the guy who, who was later found out was the Imam, Imam Soli Muhammad. He ran that mosque that I found out later that I was in. He ran that mosque like it was a Nation of Islam mosque. So I thought that's where my buddy had taken me because I was familiar with the surroundings and the way he was teaching what I later found out to be Sunni Islam. He was teaching it as if, if, as if it was the nation. So at the end, he, he asked if anybody uh, disagreed with anything he said. Would they like to raise their hand and uh, go ahead and accept the law and his messenger? And without even thinking about it, I, my, my arm shot up. And my buddy's looking at me like, I was just bringing you over here. I wasn't meaning for you to like, join in. <laughs> and that, we, that, became, that became the beginning of my Islamic journey. I had an uncle who was a part of the Nation of Islam, and my uncle, he had conversations with my grandfather, and I had the opportunity to be an earshot of one of those conversations, and to really hear the words Islam, Allah, Muhammad, Quran. This was my first introduction. Even though I really didn't understand what it was, I knew that my uncle was a Muslim. Uh, he was a part of the Nation of Islam and he was a follower of Elijah Muhammad and he changed his name. And at that time I wasn't really around a whole lot of people who were Muslims to get the information to take the next step into becoming a Muslim and um, I went to Savannah State College and I met my good brother and uh, Alhamdulillah he's here with me today and you know through debate and talking and and uh sharing things i appreciated this brother i appreciated his intellect i met a young guy by the name of paul mccoy and paul mccoy i met him through another organization and paul mccoy used to uh, come by my dorm room and one day, 
Paul used to always look at the books that I had on my uh, dresser. And one day he picked up this book called, uh, Is the Bible God's Word? I took the book home. I opened the book. I read the book. And everything that I believed was in this book. After I finished reading that book, I went home. I said to my mother, Ma, listen, um, I'm no longer a Christian. I'm now a Muslim. And uh, the good brother Jabril, he had, uh, we were back on the college campus the next day. And alhamdulillah, I took my shahada at the campus. When I was about four years old, I would live next to one of Elijah Muhammad's head minister, if not the head minister in Miami, Florida at that time. So I didn't know that the beloved Mr. Benny, who we call Mr. Benny, he was the famous Mr. Benny X down in Miami, Florida. I had no idea about that. All I knew is that he was a very good man. They called themselves Muslims. So the Christian children in the neighborhood, we knew Mr. Benny X was like, we didn't exactly know what a Muslim was, but we did understand that they, it was a different religion. They were different from us. And we understood that they were good people. Like they would always, whatever was going on in the community, they were always the type of people that would look out for the benefit of black people. So we knew that too. So in my mind, as a child coming up, I knew they, one thing, they were like black nationalists. In my mind, I knew that like they worshiped a God that might have been different from ours. In my mind, they were extremely moral people. They were definitely more moral than we were. Afterwards, I found out that the Nation of Islam had a connection to this famous person, Malcolm X. So I guess about junior high school, maybe even high school, I was going through a library and I saw this book just, it was just sticking slightly out, edged out of the library that I was in. And so when I went to correct the book, to push it back in, I noticed that I saw like a guy with a beard and I saw this light skin chin that looked like the beard of a light skinned black man. So just out of curiosity, I pulled the book out and it was the autobiography of Malcolm X. So that was like the first time I actually saw the face of the man and had an image of the man and not just heard his name through the corners or the channels of the Nation of Islam. And so that was like right then and there. I read that book and I read it from cover to cover and I read it in no time flat. Uh, absolutely drawn to it, fell in love with Malcolm X and at that point I fell in love with the Nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad and I wanted to know more about them. So that would be probably the introductions that I had to uh, becoming a uh, Muslim. In the late 1900s, many gained knowledge of Shiism due to the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran, and they were instantly attracted to Shiism because the struggles of Ahlul Bayt and their followers were very relatable to their struggles. While many may have heard about Shiism before, the Islamic Revolution in Iran brought this faith to the forefront of global news and portrayed an image of Shiism that has never been seen before. I was a Sunni Muslim. I was a Sunni Muslim for about a year. Uh, this was around the 19, 1979 or so, until the Islamic Revolution took place in Iran. And of course, being a supporter of uh, anti-capitalist revolutions like Vietnam and China and Cuba and so forth, which were our heroes at that time, uh, I was quite impressed by, by Islam once more confirming to me that it is a force for social change. And uh, I became a Shia Muslim. There were um, like uh, uh, elements uh, that was there, that was a part of that movement that understood the struggle of my people here. And they understood what happened to us, what took place uh, with us, the persecution, um, you know, the oppression, so forth and so on. Furthermore, this bringing of Shiism to the limelight and the emergence of Shi'i literature in the English language allowed many to dig deeper into their faiths where they eventually found several issues with their existing beliefs. I had an old um, Yusuf, Abdullah Yusuf Ali Quran and within that Quran in the commentary, it talked about Ahlul Bayt. It talked about Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, Fatima Zahra, salawat wa salam alayha. It talked about these individuals, but the importance of it didn't really resonate because I didn't know how important they were supposed to be. 
So uh, my friend, he's telling me, and we're, we're talking, we're debating, and me being who I am, at that point in my life, I was really, I was, I was ready to, I was ready to debate. Bring your dalil, bring your proofs and your evidences. I'm gonna bring mine. Let's go to war. Um, but again, this guy, he was gentle. He produces evidences, and he said, you know, who would know you better, your friends or your family? You love your grandfather. Who would know your grandfather better? His friends or you? Knowing the relationship I had with my grandfather, of course, me. So he introduced me to another book. The book was Then I Was Guided. And um, Muhammad Asamawi Al Tajani, who became a good friend of mine now, I read his book from cover to cover. And I said, wow, look at what they did to the Prophet's family. Look at the truth that's coming. It brought a different aspect to the religion because it explained the Prophet Muhammad as a total, complete human being, not just as a leader, but as a true family man, a man who had wives, a man who had children, a man who had grandchildren, a man who cried, a man who celebrated the birth of his children, a man that celebrated the birth of his grandchildren, a man who cried when he thought about the uh, what was going to happen in the future to his family. So when that brought it to a, a, a completeness, I said, you know, this is what I'm on. This is what I believe. This is what I should follow. I came towards Shiism because of Sunnism. And the reason why I said that is that I found all the proofs about Shiism in the books of Akhla Sunnah wa Jamaat. So all the proofs were there. I remember I was um, speaking to this Salafi brother. He used to call me. He used to call me, and he asked he 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 asked me what made me become Shia, and I told him about the, the books. And he said to me, he said, "Oh, but our scholars consider all those hadiths to be da'if." And I said, "It doesn't matter what your scholars said that they da'if." I said, "The fact that the belief of the Shia is in your books is more important than anything to me." You know. So because of that, that was the reason why, and as I started doing more research about Shiism, it became something that is felt close to me, like natural. It wasn't something that was difficult for me to be a part of. You know, when you have certain things that, if it's for you, it's so easy, and if it's not for you, it's so difficult. Even though we, we're going to have difficulties in, in life, but to be Shia, for me to follow the, the ways of Akhla Bey, seemed like it was so easy and natural for me. It just drew me to that. Just the fact about who knows you more, your family, your friends. You know, even though your friends may know certain type of intimacies that you may not, your family may not know, but your family know the true you and how you really are. I always felt when I became Muslim, like there's a piece, something's just not quite fitting right on target with me, right? Something just feels a little off. And uh, now I know, 34 years later, what that is. That was the Imam made. That was the leadership in Islam that was assigned from Allah to the Messenger of Allah and from the Messenger of Allah to our proper Imams. That was what was missing. It was the leadership piece. So Alhamdulillah, I learned about the Imamate. I learned about our Imams. And then from that point on, it was just a slow march to coming into Shiism at that point. I start begin to ask questions about, um, you know, to senior brothers uh, that was, you know, with me in Aqlu Sunnah Wajamah and they were older than me at that time. And it seemed like the more I asked those questions, um, the, the, the more resistance I, I received. You know, like I began to study Hadith and um, I see Hadith, a lot of Hadith generated by um, many of the Sahaba. I don't see that many Hadith uh, about um, Imam Ali, they said that. So I began, I go back to the Shira again, I look, I said, wait a minute, you know, Imam Ali, you know, he's raised by the Prophet. He's taught by the Prophet, you know. He's the first, one of the first Muslims to accept and, you know, uh, uh, pray with the Prophet, you know, believe in him. And why don't I see the Hadith uh, from him? Like I see Hadith from, you know, Abu Huraira and all of these other different people. Many Hadiths they generate. And I start begin to uh, look into uh, the Rijal. Uh, Looking to the biography, the biography of 
of uh, uh, many of the uh, of, of the ashab, uh, the companions, and I began to see that, for example, um, Abu Hurairah was only with Prophet maybe a few years, but we see hundreds and hundreds of, of, of hadiths that is generated by this man. It made me think and look and say, wait a minute, what is going on? You know, the Prophet, he raised Imam Ali, Islam, you know, he kept him with him the whole time, up until the time he goes back to Allah. So he must have had a lot of knowledge. Why don't we see that? One of the first books that I received, okay, dealing with the Akhru Bay, believe it or not, was uh, the Najibulaga by Imam Ali, you know, and it blew my mind. With the number of African-American Shia continuing to increase throughout the United States due to Shiaism's fundamental beliefs of equality and justice, Black Shias have been an essential contributing group to the community through various means. While these contributions are largely ignored by many, their work has established some of the most fundamental structures to Shiaism in the West. One, 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 one of the contributions I think that, 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 that is overlooked, and maybe even people don't even know it, maybe it's the first time hearing it, is keeping people loving Akhlu Bay. You know, encouraging, you know what I mean? People I encourage, have, I have encouraged, uh, um, uh, that, that was African American, that was ready to leave, okay, and never come back, okay, to, 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 to any Shia Majesty, because uh, they felt like they was never embraced. Okay, so that is a, a, a feeling that uh, maybe many don't know, some may not care about, all right, but um, this is something uh, that, you know, I have done personally, and I'm not talking about 40 years ago, I'm talking about even recently, okay? I've talked to brothers and people have called me, people call me uh, not only here in Atlanta, but in diff different parts uh, of the country, uh, places that, that, that I went or they became aware of me. And, um, you know, they say, you know, Sheikh, I, I went to the mosque and there's no English. You know, they're speaking Urdu or they're speaking Hindi or they're speaking uh, Arabic or they're speaking some other language. I don't understand nothing. You know, what what am I to do? You know, and some of them, they say, I was treated very coldly. I'm not going back to that place. They're encouraging the people to keep holding to the Akhlu Bay. That's a tremendous uh, uh, contribution, I think. Because, uh, and again, and this these things happen, okay, you know, um, and uh, uh, people not even aware. I think what we brought for the vast majority of our immigrant Shia brothers and sisters was the was English. Like open up some. Like open up so Americans and other people who are here who speak English, they can understand this beautiful religion. Like, wow, you're doing yourself such a big disservice by not having books written in English or translated into English, not having the fic issues translated into English, not having, you know, the philosophy of Islam or the philosophy of Shiism. We need that stuff in English. So I think what we brought is we brought the English piece, that the fact that people can uh, come to Shiism through the English language, right? And I think, uh, too, we brought in some openness. The fact that we were there signaled to our white brothers and sisters, it signaled to other ethnic groups, the Latino brothers and sisters, that, you know, Shiism was okay, all right, it's a door that you can walk through. Well, we're going <laughs> to, that's quite obvious, because we're going to be honest, when we look at those who give dawah, it's not the immigrant community that's giving dawah, not here in America. Because for one, you can't, a lot of times they can't relate, especially I'm talking about first generation. A lot of times the first generation cannot relate to the people that's indigenous of a country. So the ones who mostly give the dawah is of African-American descent. When you look at, say for instance, other communities of African-Americans, they flourish because they know they know, in other words, how to speak the language of the people. They know the intricacies of that language. So it's a certain thing as African Americans, when we talk, we have a certain way of talking with each other. It's not just with our words, but it's sometimes with our hand motions and also the expressions, how we bring the words out. So when you find that, you'll find a lot of times that when we talk to them, they say, man, I feel you. What do they mean by that? 
I feel you. Is it that they just understand us or they feel our words penetrating their heart? A lot of times it's that. They feel our words penetrating their heart and they feel what we're saying. Absolutely. Anytime that you're a member of society and you put something in the society um, as far as being visible as being Shiite Muslims. It's one thing to say, yes, there are black Shiite Muslims here, but when people see Shiite Muslims and see that we're not monolithic, that we are very pluralistic. So we have a, a great way of orating, a great way of conveying a message that becomes uh, very Pied Piperish to bring people in. On a global sense, we push a lot of that forward. African Americans. So because we push those things forward in other genres, even in Islam, when we speak, people have a tendency to want to listen. Not just to listen, but to want to listen. So that is an amazing contribution that we've given to this society, especially being out front as Shiite Muslims. I think our presence in the community has done a lot to uh, demystify the presence of African Americans, in particular, and Africans in general um, in the West. Uh, uh, I th uh, apart from that, I think you know there's much more that can be done, um, especially teaching uh, African students or opening up for African American students. Um, uh, sensitivity and awareness of our of the black role to play in Islam. Right now, for example, um, we only have one token black in Islam that people always refer to, which is Bilal, 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 Bilal. You know what I mean? Uh, and in our um, environment, uh, our un understanding of race uh, in terms of being African American is much more flexible and has a wider application than a lot of people think. These contributions, however, are also not limited to the Shia and Muslim communities either. In 1992, a Shia Imam in the state of California by the name of Sheikh Mujahid Abdul Karim was successful in spearheading a truce between the two largest gangs in the city of Watts, which brought the bloodshed between the Crips and the Bloods to an end. In 1992, uh, in the masjid here, I was able to get all of the three major housing, it was four housing projects, but three major ones. One is called Nickerson Gardens, and uh, another one called the Imperial Courts. They're all in proximity to each other, near, close proximity to each other. Uh, the, and the Imperial Courts housing projects and, and the Jordan Downs housing projects. And I mean, these guys was violent. Nobody wanted to work with these guys. And, uh, but alhamdulillah, uh, I told him my message is unity. I said, look, brother, why are we killing one another? I mean, the oppressor, he's going into Africa. He's getting all the gold, the diamonds in the Middle East, all the oil. Africa, got an, Africa has an ocean of oil, you know. So they're exploiting. I said, me and you, what do we have? They give us crumbs from the table in the form of welfare or whatever. I said, we have to come together, brother. This is a part of the conspiracy of the oppressor. Divide and conquer. Keep you fighting with one another. They are perpetuating this situation. And so alhamdulillah, I was able to reach them uh, reasoning and, using reasoning and logic. And uh, so from each tribe, the Nickerson Gardens, the Jordan Down Housing Projects, and the Imperial Courts ha Housing Projects, and the Hacienda, uh, we met here every Sunday for three months. And they formalized a truce. Uh, cessation of, of, of fire killing one another. Just a paperweight. And we put it at the highest places of our houses. Nonetheless, despite African Americans' massive role in contributing to and strengthening the Shia community in the West, the immigrant Shia communities were not always as welcoming as the faith was. Racism was so deeply engraved in society, even amongst the Muslim and Shia communities, that the African American struggle did not end when they entered Shiism. Many of these Shia African Americans continue to face prejudice and discrimination in the Shia communities across the U.S. with some regarding them as 
not real Shia, and others seeing them as lesser, less knowledgeable Shia due to the racist attitudes that have been previously instilled. It's funny, I was invited to speak at, um, at, a, at a center. I'm not going to name the place. <laughs> I'm not going to name the city nor the state. But I was invited to go there, and I had my imam, I had my, I had my shakely attire on. But when I walked into the center, a few of the people came in and they were asking me, like, am I okay? Am I in the right place? Because at that time, you know, they weren't used to seeing black Shia, period. But then someone who was black who was representing clergy was something really, really awkward to them. So um, they were like, are you okay? Are you in the right place? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine. And when they invited me up to Minbar to speak, after speaking and coming back down, now they want to kiss the hand and subhanAllah, alhamdulillah. The idea is, is that for people who sound like me first, who look like me, but then when you hear my voice, you know that I'm not African. I'm African American, but I'm not from that part of the world. They don't automatically give you the benefit of the doubt that, okay, you're where you're supposed to be. You are <laughs> what you're supposed to be. My first form of racism happened inside the Islamic Center for me not being the color of everyone else and then being different. And even to the day when I go and lecture in other places, I'm the only one that look like me in these places. And the first thing they said to me is, when do you convert? Oh, when did you convert? I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, you was Christian. Like, no, I wasn't Christian. I come from a Sunni background. I, my family was Sunni. I was always Muslim. I do get biases like that, that they feel that because of my color of my skin that I couldn't no way in the world be able to be born Muslim, but I had to convert to Islam. Or like one time I was with one of my friends and we was um, in a restaurant. I mean, I mean another shit is shaking. A guy asked me, he was from um, Pakistan, India. He said to me, Oh, he gave a story. He said, oh, when did you convert? And I said to him, so when did you convert? He said, stop for law. What you mean by that? I'm Muslim. I'm Muslim. I've been Muslim my whole life. I said, well, you know, I thought all people from India was Hindu. He said, oh, stop for law. No, no. I said, so why would you see, when you see a black person, why would you think that all of us was Christian and that we converted to Islam? But like I said, once I start wearing the imama, start wearing the turban and the clothes, the clothes of the student, I started to realize that they do treat you different. You know, they, they figure when they see me, they figure that I don't know first before they say that I do know. They say, oh, I thought you didn't know. But someone from somewhere else, they will say, oh, he knows. But why is that? It's because where I'm from, the color of my skin. It's a hard acceptance to some communities for us. It's a hard acceptance. Because if it wasn't for that their children needed to hear English, we probably wouldn't be called. If it wasn't for they wanted their children to be able to understand how to be Muslim, you know, in a society like this, we probably wouldn't be called. When I, when I went to Iran, uh, there was a lot of racism against uh, black people in Qom. I had to uh, debrief my children whenever they came to school, came home from school. I had to debrief them, you know, because there would be racist types of behaving. For example, if you look at a lot of uh, uh, Iranian picture books for kids, you know, uh, you would find that uh, images of the shaitan would be dark, would be black, you know, image, images of the mu'minin would be white, you know, in terms of, let's say, the struggle between the believers and the kuffar, the kuffar would always have a darker complexion and the, and the believers always have a lighter complexion, you know, you had that type of stuff. You know, I remember one day on the anniversary of either the Wiladat or the Wafat, I can't remember, of Imam Jawad, alayhi salam, who is a very controversial figure in, among the Imams because of the color of his skin, right? He was extremely black, not dark, but extremely black. You know, uh, this, um, this sheikh who was leading the prayer, uh, be, uh, the Dura and Asr prayer, you know, between the Dura and Asr prayer, what happens is like, you know, if it was a special occasion, they would have maybe a 10 minute talk about, about somebody or something. And he gave a talk about Imam Jawad in this 10 minutes and spent seven of those minutes trying to do Tauji, explain away the color of the Imam. Why is that so important? 
While Shiism and Islam itself is not racist and has never distinguished between the races as highlighted in the Holy Quran and the Hadiths of Ahlul Bayt that say that there is no priority between individuals except in Taqwa, certain Hadiths portray a different image that many believe need to be addressed. Black is considered an Abe, you know, a, a deficiency. Um, it, it can go so far as in uh, Sunni Hadith, you have a statement that says anybody who describes the Prophet Sallallahu as black should be killed. Gosh, come on. You know, is that, if you call him white, it's okay. What if you call him black, he should be killed? You know, one of the most, the most racist um, accounts, however, that I've come across um, that sort of masquerades as Hadith and so forth or you know, uh, official accounts of, uh, of, 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 of in Islam, you know, is the story of Imam Hussein and the, and the, and the, 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 the character of John, you know, um, which is really putting racist ideas in the mouth of John. You know, where John says, for example, I don't smell, I, do, I smell badly, you know, and my skin is black, um, and I want to die so that my blood be mingled with yours and so on. You know, I think it's very embarrassing, it's very demeaning, you know, and um, based upon research by uh, Sister, Sister Amina Inlows, um, it has been proven that really John is a composite character uh, and the words put in the mouth of John is something of more, more recent than the actual events in Karbala. Amongst these are alleged hadiths from our Imams that single out several groups, including Africans and Kurds, recommending that the believers should not marry from them. These hadiths have been used by anti-Shia groups to accuse the faith of institutionalizing racism against Africans. There are problematic texts about race and ethnicity in Sunni books and in Shi'i books. I'm not saying they're authentic texts or correct fatwas, but we do know that Historically, we've accreted a fair amount of material, sometimes attributed as hadith, which is not correct. Now, the fatwas in question here uh, are with respect to marriage. There are some fatwas based on various narrations saying it is not desirable to marry people from certain ethnic groups, uh, among which are uh, people from a certain part of East Africa, Kurdish people, um, very blue-eyed people, uh, people from certain Turkish groups and some parts of the Indian subcontinent. Now, the problem with these fatwas is that they were mentioned by uh, classical scholars, like, you know, first few hundred years of Islamic history, but some of them did pass on to the present day. So they did continue to be copied in books and related in books until the present day. No one is infallible except the infallibles. When we look at great figures in history, including great scholars, maybe they got 95% of things right. Maybe they got 99% of things right. It doesn't mean they got everything right, and this is something they got wrong. How do I know they got it wrong? Because the first criterion for examining a narration or, or ruling is, is to compare it against the Holy Quran and to compare it against the Holy Quran and then the established parts of the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet The idea that you shouldn't marry certain groups for ethnic or racial reasons is clearly against the Quran and the Sunnah and, and the very obvious and known practice of, of the Holy Prophet and Imams. So we don't need to sit here and do a chain of narration, authenticity, book sourcing, etc. Where does the fatwa come from and how does it get derived discussion? It's clearly wrong and someone made a mistake. And we can say, well, it got passed on. There are other things that have gotten passed on to the present era that are considered problematic or maybe just weren't thought about a lot. And we set it aside. It's that clear. Now, as for why these texts came into being in the first place? That's a good question. One thing you can observe about many of these groups uh, is that they were border races that there was war against. So maybe that led to some conflict or hostility. 
Through a study of the lives of the Imams السلام, we see that out of the 12 Imams, six married non-Arab women, three of whom appear to be of African origin. Furthermore, according to our scholars, many of these narrations object clear verses of the Holy Quran as well as authentic and strong narrations. O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female, and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. I think within the Shia community, we, we have to first get past our cultural norm. We have to make a divided, make a distinction between what's our cultural norm and what's the Islamic norm. And the two are not always synonymous. Understanding that our differences weren't there to make us separated, but we're so much better when we're all brought together. Once people can understand that, then it becomes easy to remove racism because you realize that there's only one race, and that's the human race. But people's need to be better than someone, to make themselves different, to make themselves stand out, even if it's something as silly as the color of one's skin, the texture of one's hair, the, the, the language that they speak. Well, first of all, I think we need to be able to uncover and uproot the racism in ourselves first. You can't, you can't challenge racism if you have that virus inside of, your, inside of, your, inside of yourself as well. Um, and uh, once you confront this, and the only way I think you could confront this is by having relationships with black people, you know, or, or non-white people or people from not in your ethnic group and that type of a thing, you know, um, who could help you understand yourself, really. Uh, and that means you need to have honest relationships with people, not superficial relationships with them. Um, and, and as long as this, does, this, uh, this happens, or if this does not happen, you cannot do anything about it. Um, a lot of young uh, Shia Muslims in this country, for example, um, are not as racist as their parents. With the Quran and many authentic hadiths pushing us towards unity and holding together to the rope of Allah, Shia communities across the world must focus on combating racism within their centers and amongst their families. We should strive to become a more inclusive society who stands with our brothers and sisters of all colors against the injustices they face. And uh, what did the incident that happened with George Floyd, okay, uh, which was, um, you know, a very um, tragic uh, event, you know. Um, you know, when people have saw that, uh, that tape and see this man being murdered, okay, right in front of everybody on tape being filmed, um, if you ask anybody in the African American community, they would tell you this been happening. Okay? The only difference is, is that it's filmed. It was filmed. Okay? And so, um, uh, this is something that, inshallah, we all should try to unite and struggle against. Because it's the African American today. It could be the Arab tomorrow. You know, it could be the Asian next week or next year. You know? That's how these things happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us through, through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he said, if you see a wrong, remove it with your hand. And if you're not able to, to remove that monka with your hand, at least speak out against it with your tongue. And if you're not able to do that, at least the weakest of Iman, okay, is to hate or condemn that thing in his heart. And I think if nothing else, we should be able to come together to do that. As such, the unjust murder of George Floyd and many, many others before him should be an awakening call, not only to condemn and speak up against racism, but most importantly, to fight it within our communities. And I saw no kind of action designed to bring it into existence or bring it about. Then uh, I turned in a different direction. Are you still a Muslim yourself? Oh, yes. I'm You're a Muslim. I believe in the religion of Islam, which believes in brotherhood complete brotherhood of all people.